Welcome back to Networks and Distributed Systems, course based on the textbook by Jim Carose and Keith Ross, Computer Networking, a Top-Down Approach. We are in the process of discussing the network layer. We are now on our eighth lesson in this module, and we will be talking about dynamic host configuration protocol of the network layer. So let's pick up where we left off. Once an organization has obtained a block of addresses, it can assign individual IP addresses to the host and router interfaces in its organization. A system administrator will typically manually configure the IP addresses into the router, often remotely, with a network management tool. Host addresses can also be configured manually, but more often this task is now done using the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, abbreviated DHCP. DHCP allows a host to be allocated an IP address automatically. A network administrator can configure DHCP so that a given host receives the same IP address each time it connects to the network or a host may be assigned a temporary IP address that will be different each time the host connects to the network. In addition to host IP address assignment, DHCP will also will allow a host to learn additional information, such as its subnet mask, the address of its first hop router, often called the default gateway, and the address of its local DNS server. Because of DHCP's ability to automate the network-related aspects of connecting a host into a network, it is sometimes referred to as a plug-and-play protocol. This capability makes it very attractive to the network administrator who would otherwise have to perform these tasks manually. DHCP is also enjoying widespread use in residential internet access networks and in wireless local area networks or wireless LANs, where hosts can join and leave the network frequently. Consider, for example, the student who carries a laptop from a dormitory room to a library to a classroom. It is likely that in each location the student will be connecting into a new subnet and therefore will need a new IP address at each location. DHCP is ideally suited to this situation as there are many users coming and going and addresses are needed for only a limited amount of time. DHCP is also useful in residential ISP access networks. Consider, for example, a residential ISP that has 2,000 customers, but no more than 400 customers are ever online at the same time. In this case, rather than needing a block of 2,048 addresses, a DHCP server that assigns addresses dynamically needs only a block of 512 addresses. For example, a block in the form of a.b.c.d/24. As the hosts join and leave, the DHCP server needs to update its list of available IP addresses. Each time a host joins, the DHCP server allocates an arbitrary address from its current pool of available addresses, and each time a host leaves, its address is returned to the pool. DHCP is a client-server protocol. A client is typically a newly arriving host wanting to obtain network configuration information, including an IP address for itself. In the simplest case, each subnet will have a DHCP server. If no server is present on the subnet, a DHCP relay agent, typically a router that knows the address of a DHCP server for that network, is needed. In figure 4.20 that you see here, a DHCP server is attached to subnet 223.1.2-24. 
Figure 4.20 shows a DHCP server attached to subnet 223.1.2/24, with the router serving as a relay agent for arriving clients attached to subnets 223.1.1/24 and 223.1.3/24. We'll assume that a DHCP server is available on the subnet. For a newly arriving host, the DHCP protocol is a four-step process as shown in this figure here. And as you can see, there is a newly arriving client. The four steps are DHCP server discovery. The first task of a newly arriving host is to find a DHCP server with which to interact. This is done using a DHCP discover message which a client sends within a UDP packet to port 67. The UDP packet is encapsulated in an IP datagram. But to whom should this datagram be sent? The host doesn't even know the IP address of the network to which it is attaching, much less the address of a DHCP server on this network. Given this, the DHCP client creates an IP datagram containing its DHCP discover message along with a broadcast destination IP address of 255.255.255.255, as we discussed earlier and a this host source IP address of 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0 because as you know it doesn't have an IP address yet. The DHCP client passes the IP datagram to the link server which then broadcasts the frame to all nodes attached to the subnet. The DHCP server offers a DHCP server receiving a DHCP discover message responds to the client with a DHCP offer message that is broadcast to all nodes on the internet. Again using IP broadcast address 255.255.255.255. You might want to think about why this server reply must also be broadcast. Since several DHCP servers can be present on the subnet, the client may find itself in the enviable position of being able to choose from among several offers. Each server offer message contains the transaction ID of the received discover message, the proposed IP address of the client, the network mask, and an IP lease time, the amount of time for which the IP address will be valid. It is common for the server to set the lease time to several hours or days. Did you think about why the server broadcasts that message? Because the requesting client doesn't have an IP address. There was no IP address to send that message to. That's the whole purpose of this. The DHCP request. The newly arriving client will choose from among one or more server offers and respond to its selected offer with a DHCP request message echoing back the configuration parameters. DHCP Acknowledgement The server responds to the DHCP request message with a DHCP Acknowledgement message confirming the requested parameters. Once the client receives the DHCP acknowledgement, the interaction is complete and the client can use the DHCP allocated IP address for the lease duration. Since the client may want to use its address beyond the lease expiration, DHCP also provides a mechanism that allows a client to renew its lease on an IP address. The value of DHCP's plug-and-play capability is terrific for the IT administrator, considering that the alternative is to manually configure a host's IP address. Consider the student who moves from classroom to library to dorm room with a laptop, joins a new subnet, and this obtains a new IP address at each location. It's hard to imagine that a system administrator would have to reconfigure laptops at each location 
and few students would have the expertise to configure their laptops manually. Present company accepted, of course. From the mobility aspect, however, DHCP does have shortcomings. Since a new IP address is obtained from DHCP each time a node connects to a new subnet, a TCP connection to a remote application cannot be maintained as a mobile node moves between subnets. Mobile IP, or MIP as it's abbreviated, is an Internet Engineering Task Force standard communication protocol that is designed to allow mobile device users to move from one network to another while maintaining a permanent IP address. The mobile IP allows for host independent routing of IP datagrams on the Internet. Each mobile node is identified by its home address disregarding its current location in the network. While away from its home network, a mobile node is associated with a care of address, which identifies its current location and its home address is associated with the local endpoint of a tunnel to its home agent. Mobile IP specifies how a mobile node registers with its home agent and how the home agent routes datagrams to the mobile node through the tunnel. Well, there you have our discussion of DHCP. We mentioned that a client might receive multiple answers to its DHCP request. What do you think happens to all those additional answers that it gets with those IP addresses that are being allocated by those other DHCP servers that it does not select? Well, that's enough for this lesson. That covers DHCP. Let's uh, take a break now. Think about that little challenge right there. And go over your notes and then update your study guide. And when you're ready, come on back and we'll continue.